Hey everybody, welcome to today's webinar where we're going to talk about whether or not your content is resonating and how to really use it to build connections. Um, my name is Hannah Abaza. I've got Lena here as well from Snap App. Hey Lena. Hey guys, good to talk to you. <laughs> so it looks like we still are having quite a few people kind of rolling in and logging in. So before we jump into the content, um, let's actually hear where everybody's dialing in from. So uh, for those of you that are already online and logged in, just type into the chat box. Let us know where you're dialing in from. I know I'm actually in Toronto, Canada, and we're having the weirdest weather. It was snowing this morning like you wouldn't believe, and now it's pouring rain. It's so strange. <laughs> Um, and wow. Lena, you're in Boston, right? We're in Boston, and we've had crazy weather too. It felt, you know, close to spring, and then yesterday had a little bit of snow in the evening. Crazy. So crazy. all over the map too. Cool. And it looks like we've got a ton of representation here. We've got Andre from Portugal, Philadelphia, Sharon from Tampa, awesome, um, Susan from San Mateo, Baltimore, Philadelphia. Sunny Southern California. Daniel, I'm super jealous. I wish I was in sunny Southern California right now. <laughs> Allison from Portland. Portland apparently is the place to be lately. I keep hearing Portland everywhere. Uh, Petawawa, Canada. Great. Great Canadian representation. Kitchener. Awesome. Um, wow, Lena, it looks like we've got people from everywhere. Margaret yeah, this in New is York, amazing. Because the weather is crazy there too. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love how the weather is like the thing that bonds everybody. He's <laughs> so funny. Yep. Yeah. Vancouver, yep. Calgary, uh, Moldova. Amazing. Hey, Walter. All right. Wow. Cool. So it looks like most people have trickled in. Um, as fun as it would be to just see where everybody's calling in from, we should probably get started. Uh, so before I pass you guys off to Lena, who I know has prepped um, an awesome presentation for you, she's going to kick things off today. <laughs> so before we do that, let's get into some of the housekeeping. First item of housekeeping is that I am getting over a pretty significant cough. So if I do go into a coughing fit during the webinar, I apologize. I will try and mute myself and make sure Lena takes over. Um, so be forewarned. Uh, other thing you guys should make note of is that we will be sending the recording. We always get that question. Um, so never fear. You'll have the recording in your inbox within the next day or two. We'll also send you the slides. So you will have everything you need to go back and take a look at what's happening or what happened in the webinar. And of course, we'll be doing Q&A at the end of the webinar, but feel free to type your questions into the chat box anytime throughout. So as you start to think of them, put your questions into the chat box. I'll be flagging them so we can circle back to them later. Um, and if it makes sense, we might even pick up on a few of them while we're actually going through some of the material. Um, now, because we're sending you the slides and because you are also getting the recording, you don't need to take notes. Feel free to sit back, relax, tweet your little heart out. We're using hashtag uberwebinar. Um, and anytime Lena says something that's mind-blowing, <laughs> make sure you take a screenshot of the slide, tweet at us. <laughs> like I said, we've got somebody um, from Uberflood, somebody from SnapApp you can tweet at as well. And last but not least, um, stick around towards the end for a quick demo. So after questions for those of you that are interested, um, we will actually show you a little bit about what Uberflow does and how it relates to your content marketing. Um, and I think that's it on the housekeeping, guys. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Lena. Lena, I'm super excited for this because I think this is something that's often overlooked is, you know, whether or not your content is resonating with people and how you can actually start to use it to build connection. So I'll let you take it away from here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hannah, for that great intro. As Hannah mentioned, today we're going to talk about resonance. I want to start with the physical definition of resonance because I think it's really important to ground this conversation in what we actually mean when we say resonance. On the, on the sort of physics side of it, it's actually the intensification and enriching of a musical tone by supplementary vibration. That's a lot of what might sound sort of jargon or technical, but basically what it means is a vibration in one place causes a vibration somewhere else because of a fundamental connection between the two, a, a sort of what's called a resonant frequency. So an easy metaphor for me in thinking about what we mean when we say resonance is think about a violin. So 
a violin is built to resonate. It's, you know, years and years of research and work has gone into making beautiful instruments that are constructed to resonate. And what happens is you have a violin, all the strings are still, and then if you pluck one string, a second string will start vibrating, maybe just a little bit, maybe a lot, depending on the note, based solely on that overlap and resonant frequencies. This works for me because I'm a music nerd and have you know, plucked a violin string or two in my day. But what the important thing here is it's building a connection and vibrating pieces between, you know, in one place and, and vibrating somewhere else. So you can think about this when you think about resonance in marketing. It works exactly the same way. The basic idea is that something you're going to write, something you say, something you comment or tweet sparks a reaction in the brain or the heart or the, or the soul of your listener. It's it's sparking that reaction because of something that they believe is a fundamental similarity between the way that you both think. So why are we talking about resonance? Why is this so important in marketing and in content marketing? Because content is everywhere. There's an incredible crush of content bearing down on us every single day. It's been like this you know, ever since the printing press was invented. There's always been too much content for anyone to conceivably um, consume in their lifetime. And right now, most of the content that marketers are creating, I hate to break it to you, but it's not resonating. It's not working. It's not breaking through the barrier of attention that has been put up for our audience. When, and why, why is that? It's not resonating. Our audience doesn't care about it. It gets ignored because we're not resonating. And we're not resonating because we're too busy. You know, marketers always talk about how busy we are. That means we don't take the time to learn about our audience. We don't take the time to tailor that content to our buyer personas or to specific stages. And we don't have the tools that we need to tell us who wants content, who wants what content, and when. So the first step to resonating with your content, to building a connection through your content, is you really have to love your audience. You have to know who they are. You have to know what makes them tick. And you have to know what they'll care about so you can deliver it to them. So who really is your audience? This is an absolute core requirement of creating content that resonates. You have to have a deep, empathetic knowledge of your customer. You have to know what matters to them. You have to know what their biggest challenges, obstacles, and goals are. And if you know that, if you get to know that person, then you can start creating content that makes, it, that makes an impact and makes a difference for your audience. And that content looks like a little bit like this. You know, a word cloud is always a hard sort of medium to communicate this stuff in, but it's stories. It's nostalgia. Resonant content might feel, make you feel something. Like it makes you feel warm and, and have memories about um, something in your life that triggered that reaction. It might make you say, yeah, I do that. I have that feeling. It might create some kind of echo between what you say and what your audience hears. Um, it will amplify your message because through sort of word of mouth marketing, someone who has resonated with the content you've created will spread that message out. Um, it's exciting. It's feelings. It's empathy. It's um, it's that vibration between something that I said and something you heard. Um, those are some of the things that come to mind for me when I think about resonance. This screenshot of my browser tab windows is another thing that comes to mind when I think about resonance. I mentioned earlier that a lot of marketers are super, super busy and we're all about multitasking. So as soon as I see a screenshot like this, I'm like, yeah, that's what my screen looks like. That's my life too. That's a little piece of resonance. That's a little piece of bringing a similarity, sort of bridging the gap between you and your listener. And how do you get there? Like, how do you find out that you know 
marketers are busy and they're going to resonate with a billion browsers to have Windows being open at once. You have to ask them. You ask them what matters to them, and you find out through their actual words what, um, what they really care about. As I said before, empathy is really, really important here. You're, you're going to speak to your customer, and you're going to learn about them. You're going to learn their hopes and their dreams. You, you need to get really, really close to them so you can find out that deep truth that you can connect with with your content. It's about, it's about listening. It's about knowing what problems your prospect is facing and why, really hearing what your prospect is saying and taking a, you know, some type of understanding out of that to to your content. That kind of empathy, approaching your content creation from a place of empathy goes a long way. But in order to get there, you need to, kn you need to know your customer. And there are a bunch of different ways to do that, which I'm going to go through right now. You, as I mentioned, you need to know who your audience is. But, so what do you actually need? to create and deliver resonant content? Where, what type of data do you need, and where can you get it? The types of information that you really need um, are you need to find out who your audience is, what are their goals, what, are their, what problems do they have in meeting those goals, what obstacles are in their way. A really important thing to know is what are the questions that they're asking along the way, along their content journey. Those questions are the answers that you're, you should answer those questions through your content. What type of person is this? This is a persona question, but it's also just a who are they question. Um, you know, you might have marketing mark, the persona, but your persona might not go into depth about marks, TV watching habits, or you know, if he's a pessimist or an optimist, that kind of thing. You want to know how they like to buy. Do they like to have a salesperson call them right away and guide them through the process? Would they rather research everything up front and know all of the information they could possibly need to know before they get on a demo call? All of that stuff is really important to know. And then how do they consume information? Is this someone who gets referrals from their colleagues, from um, someone who spends a lot of time on social media. Where are they getting their information? It's helpful for you because then you can bring your resident content to those places where they already are. How do you collect all this information? That was a long laundry list of the different types of data that you should be gathering about your audience. So where does that come from? Very top of this list is customer interviews. I know it seems like a lot of time, a lot of investment in interviewing your customers, but it's absolutely, absolutely necessary and will pay dividends in terms of how much you will know about your audience and the type of content that you'll be able to create that's really tailored to them. A lot of content creators that I talk to swear by speaking with customers in person. They'll set aside you know, a 20-minute block, even just once a month on their calendar to have coffee with a customer. If your customers aren't local, you know, call them up on the phone. Ideally, have a Skype conversation so you can see their face and see their body language. Here, you're not just looking for the answers to your questions. You also want to get to know how they speak. What words do they use? Are they positive? Are they negative? Are they super energetic? Are they more reserved? All of this is really, really valuable information for you that you can pull into your content later. And maybe you find out that you know, a lot of your customers are super cynical about Valentine's Day. So instead of a, you know, we love you, it's Valentine's Day type of customer outreach email, maybe you would send something a little bit funnier and, and darker, I guess, around Valentine's Day. But you would never know that until you spoke to your customers. Another really great place to get information about who your customers are and what they care about is social media. You can find out who they're following, what they're saying, what words they're using. Again, um, that type of social listening is really powerful. One, um, one friend of mine that I talked to reads every help desk ticket that comes across um, 
his support team to find out what these questions are that their customers are asking. What are the things that they're struggling with in the product, in their marketing? What do they wish the product could do? It's a really amazing source for like from the horse's mouth type of challenges that your content can directly support. Surveys and interactive content are two other really effective ways to gather this kind of information. Every piece of interactive content or every survey that you put out there can ask questions, and you can pull that information back into your marketing automation system, into an Excel spreadsheet, anywhere that you can collect all of that information and, um, and use it in your marketing. I had a really great, speaking of customer conversations, I had a great um, customer conversation about using a survey to get these kind of horse's mouth um, answers from customers. It was right around Christmas, and this company does data backup and disaster recovery. So they put out a survey asking their customers what their um, data backup nightmare before Christmas was, like the sort of Tim Burton nightmare before Christmas theme. And they asked people, just you know, put in whatever your worst nightmare would be for your data backup. Um, you know, you're on vacation. What's the worst disaster that could happen? And they got 25 unique responses of the worst thing that this customer could imagine happening over the course of a vacation. That's an incredible boon for a content marketer where you have all of these stories and these like visceral reactions from your audience that you can bring into a piece of content that you create and get that kind of resonance, get that kind of like, oh my God, that would, be, that would suck so much. Like, you want that feeling. You want someone to have that kind of reaction to your content. All right, so we know we need to know our audience. We know we need to talk to them, gather all of this really powerful information. But you can have all of that stuff. You can be really close to your customers and know them really well and know exactly what problems they need solving and still not resonate. I'm sorry. I know that's painful. But you still have to deliver an amazing experience, an amazing piece of content in order to resonate. How do you actually do that? Um, it is super tough. <laughs> um, the content experience you provide has to really be something super special in order to resonate. I mentioned earlier there's this content crush happening. It's happening not just to like the keyword stuffing, like crappy content creators. It's happening to the people who <laughs> care about this stuff too. Like it's happening to the people that are creating valuable content too because there's literally not enough time in the day to consume everything that could be valuable. Um, so you need to actually go a step further to create content that's going to connect with your audience specifically. One step along the path to this way of resonating is you have to honestly just get really good at what you're doing. Um, it's sort of a <laughs> kind of it depends type of answer, but it requires writing a lot, honing your craft, and knowing the right way to sort of string together a sentence and carve some sort of imagery into your words that will connect with people. So a friend of mine, Andy Christadina from Orbit Media said, empathy is really difficult. Um, it's a skill, the same type of skill that you, know, you need to, to work on to build. But if you improve it and you get a little bit better and better over time, ultimately you'll end up writing content that does resonate. That's so totally real that readers actually feel it. I think that getting your reader to actually feel what you say is the hardest part about this and requires just writing a lot. The other piece of this is that you have to be radically generous with your content. You have to give your audience everything that you have. That's where um, people who are really, really succeeding in content marketing are you know, heads and shoulders above the rest. They're the Moz guides to SEO that are you know, 11 3,000-word chapters and 
have everything you could ever possibly want to know about SEO. That's an incredible piece of content and something that has earned Moz a lot of fans. This content is hard to, hard to produce, but what you're asking your audience to do for you is pay you for this content. They're paying with their information. So it should be valuable enough that they would have paid with actual money. So if your audience would actually pay for it, that you're on the right track. You're creating content that's super valuable, that's relatable to them, relevant to them. It's an incredible resource. They're going to say, thank you, thank you for producing this for me, for putting this together just for me. And you'll be able to um, – that's a, lo a lot of what resonance is, is feeling like this was something produced just for me that I'm going to say thank you for. Another piece um, in the sort of journey toward resonance is this idea of finding a kernel of insight. This is something that I borrowed from Doug Kessler from Velocity Partners. And he says that you need to know your audience super, super well such that you can distill some kind of key insight about who they are or what makes them tick that is like really, really deep down that even your reader might not know is there. But when they interact with your content, they, that's what makes them say, oh, yeah, or that's what makes the content really go viral because it, it struck that chord and uh, made it something that someone felt like was just for them. So a great example of this um, from Doug, this is his recommendation, is this video called Dumb Ways to Die, which was a campaign from the Melbourne Transportation Department promoting rail safety. And I will tell you to Google it, but I will say, be prepared to have this song stuck in your head for the rest of the day. But <laughs> it's basically a video about helping, trying to get teenagers to be safer around trains, because trains, as we know, are very dangerous. It's um, you know, a, sadly a frequent cause of death in Melbourne. So this ad agency created Dumb Ways to Die, which is a cute little video with you know, half a, a dozen or so different really dumb ways to die, like sticking a fork in the toaster or, um, I don't know, like sitting inside of the washing machine and turning it on. Like really, really stupid ways that you could hurt yourself and die. So it's all of these stupid ways. And then at the end, it's three ways that you could die around trains. And the kernel of insight here is the only thing a teenager fears more than death is looking stupid. You don't want to look stupid. You don't want to die in a dumb way. Like, you not only do you not want to die, you really, really don't want to die in a way that somebody is going to call stupid or dumb or whatever. So this kernel of insight probably also helped along by the like really, really catchy song that the video was set to ended up helping this piece of content go really viral. And Melbourne says that this has contributed to, I'm not sure exactly what percentage of decrease of rail accidents. So what's one example of this agency really understood teenagers and understood that at this point in your life, getting embarrassed or looking stupid is literally the worst thing that could happen to you. So here are some takeaways. What did we learn here? Reson I hope you took away that resonance is super critical. You need to know who your audience is, what they care about. Start there. If you're not already totally laser focused on your audience and delivering for their needs, start, start there. And then collect the information that you really need to, or collect the data sources that you need to know to get that audience information. Look for Set up, setting up those audience interviews, setting up the right tools that you need to be able to do social listening, all the different avenues for gathering that information. And then use that information for good. Create really amazing, valuable content that your audience wants, audi that your audience has explicitly asked for in a help desk ticket. All of that stuff will send you right on your way to resonating with content. And the next step, once you have that amazing content, is making sure that it's in an amazing context. So I'm going to let Hannah take it from here. Awesome. Thanks so much, Lena. That was great. 
Um, so I think <coughs> what I'd like to do, sorry guys, excuse the coughing. Um, what I'd like to do is, is take a step back. I think Lena really drove the point home around how important it is to ensure that your content really is truly resonating with people. I know um, we kind of think about that sometimes as table stakes, but the reality is when you look at the content out there, it, as you said, Lena, it's just really not <laughs> at the end of the day. Um, mm -hmm. <coughs> so yeah. how do we how do we think about this in a, in a practical sense, and how do we sort of take a step back and maybe look at the context and the sort of evolution of, um, of kind of content? So let's take a step back in time to, I don't know, maybe around 2010-ish, somewhere around there, um, where content was crowned king. Right? And when content took its throne, all of us marketers were like, <laughs> we need to publish all of the time. Publish, publish, publish. Keep that editorial calendar full. It's all about quantity, quantity, quantity. And, and this also um, kind of links back to you know, what you mentioned, Lena, about you know, not just the good content, but the keyword stuffing, blanket the interwebs with random links and content everywhere. Um, <coughs> now, unfortunately, or fortunately I should say, um, that wasn't sustainable because the people that were consuming our content essentially said, no, we, we're not going to we're not going to consume content this way. But also Google said no. So over the past few years, and interestingly enough, it really hasn't been that long since we've been talking about this, but really over the past few years we've been talking about quality over quantity. We don't need more content, we need better content. And in a sense, we need content that's going to resonate with those people that we're talking to. And really smart people are beating the drum of better content, quality over quantity, um, like Anne Handley. And I, I really love this quote because I think it goes back to when you were speaking about empathy. Um, she really talks about how great content is useful, inspired, and pathologically empathetic. Which totally. I think really, yeah, and I mean that ties really into, hey, is it resonating with you? Because to me, it's, that's, that really goes hand in hand, right? Yeah, for sure. So, so we know now that you know, it's not just about quantity, it's about quality. We know that we need better content, not more content. I don't think that's anything new for, for people that are actually listening. I think you guys all know this. You're smart people. You've been doing content for the most part. Um, just by virtue of the fact that you're on this webinar, you want to take your content to the next level. So this is new stuff. But really, it's really only over the past year or maybe maybe year and a half, I would say, that we're really starting to ask ourselves as marketers, like, hey, is this content thing really working to accomplish our business objective? And how do we actually leverage content to get those results? How do we reach our goals? Um, it's one thing to publish content, but it's a whole other thing to, number one, optimize it for lead generation, engagement, subscribers, whatever your main goal may be. And it's another thing to be able to measure those results. And I'm going to let you guys in on a dirty little secret. As much as we talk about great content and as much as we talk about how it needs to resonate, the dirty little secret is really that great content isn't enough. Great content is your starting point. Great content is essential. But now we're beyond the point of just putting great content out there. You need an overall experience that really resonates with people. The content is one element, but at the end of the day, the bar for creating a really good user experience or content experience, as we say here at Uberflip, has been raised. And most of us as, as marketers need to make sure we're kind of keeping up with that trend and that we're really presenting an experience that is compelling for people, that's resonating for people beyond the actual content itself. So I want to show you guys a little bit about how we think of the content marketing cycle here at Uberflip. Um, traditionally, most people think of content in sort of three phases. You create the content, you distribute it, you put it out there, and then you get a bunch of insights and see how it did, and then you kind of rinse and repeat. Based on the insights, you create more content, better content, different content, you distribute, you get insights. So it should be an iterative process. Now, the problem with this is it's somewhat flawed. And because it's sort of a little bit flawed, we end up skipping over one of the most essential pieces, which is really that experience piece. And that experience piece is actually something we think of when we think of our content marketing cycle. So we create the content, great. But then where is it going to live? What's the experience when people are consuming it? What is the best way to present this to people that could be 
um, you know, talking about the format. That could be talking about how we optimize the content in order to meet our goals. That could be whether or not the content should be interactive. Um, what's the experience? How are you actually putting that in front of people? And that's one of the essential pieces that most marketers these days are forgetting, or they just don't have the tools to make it happen. So I know, Lena, you've probably been in this situation before where, you know, as a marketer, you really know you need a good user experience. You really know you need to change things on your, you know, uh, blog or your resource center or wherever your content is held. But you're kind of handcuffed because you have to get a developer to do it, and it's going to take eight weeks, right? Most marketers yeah, pretty much. With that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, how can you start to think about this in a way that really lets marketing execute quickly, and that really helps us optimize that experience? So, again, we're meeting our goals. Now, I keep I keep talking about goals. <laughs> so, what are we talking about when we're talking about goals? Well. In this case, I mean, I'm really talking a lot about B2B marketing. I think we have a lot of our audience that are kind of skewed B2B, but this also is applicable in the B2C context. So common goals from a B2B content marketing standpoint are, hey, we want to generate leads. Right? And again, we're talking quality here. We're not talking quantity. If all I had to do was generate a high quantity of leads, I bet you I could do that and I could kill it, no problem. But there's this little caveat that we don't necessarily want everybody. We want a very specific slice of the market. So that makes things much, much harder. So lead generation is one goal. Um, and because we want quality over quantity, it's really about making sure that that experience, that content is resonating with the right people, not just random people. Um, another goal could be collecting subscribers, growing your audience base. Another goal could be engagement, getting people to share your content, getting people to click, getting people to <laughs> fill out calls to action, getting people to um, comment, whatever that might be for you. So how do we normally do this in most, most marketing teams? So most marketers sit down in a room with a whiteboard, and they just throw a whole bunch of ideas at the, at the wall. Right? Um, I've been in those meetings. Lena, I'm sure you've been in those meetings, right? Oh, for sure. Yeah, so we're just sort of sitting there, and we're brainstorming a bunch of ideas, and we're like, okay, well, we think these are good ideas. Let's pick the ones we think are the best, and then we're going to create that content. Then we're going to publish it, yay, and then we're going to share it with everybody, and then the results are typically kind of mixed. So why is that? Well, there's a few reasons why that is. One of them it could just be that the goals weren't clarified from the beginning. But let's say you're on top of that. Let's say you know what your goals are. The big reason for the kind of meh results is because, number one, you don't prototype your content ideas and ensure that you're creating content that's resonating. And number two, you don't optimize the overall content experience. So here's how we do it at Uberflip. We actually try as much as possible to ask people what kind of content they want. And Lena talked about this um, I think at length, and I think you brought up some really great points. As marketers, we don't talk to customers enough. And this is really something that we need to get more comfortable doing. Um, it's funny. So we, we actually just recently launched a, a podcast at Uberflip. If you go to uberflip.com slash podcast, you can check it out. One of the people we interviewed was Matthew Sweezy. Now, Matthew is the Principal of Marketing Insights at Salesforce, and one of his number one tips for what he calls um, agile content marketing and kind of being able to create better content faster is to base your content on what he calls user stories. And that's really just snippets of things that your customers are telling you, that your audience is telling you. And that can be the best way to create that content that's resonating. Um, and then once you know that, whether you're outright asking people, whether you're, you know, like your friend Lena, whether you, whether you're actually dipping into the customer service emails and reading some of those, um, however you're getting that data, that's going to help feed your content creation process. Now, for us, once the content is created, then we optimize the experience based on our goal. Is this a premium piece of content for lead gen? Great. If it is, I need to optimize the form that we're going to collect the data on. I need to optimize the surrounding share buttons. I need to make sure that it's living in a place in my resource center where it's going to be discoverable. I need to make sure it's living in a place that's tailored to my audience. Um, so all of that stuff is important to consider when you're looking at optimizing experience. And then of course publish the content and tell everybody. And then when you start to really follow that process of you know, making sure you know what people want and then optimizing the experience based on the goals, you start to see much, much better results. So let's talk about the content experience sort of at two levels. There's the micro experience where we're looking at optimizing the individual piece of content. But then there's the overall macro content experience. And here's what I mean by that. 
micro experience is a one-off piece of content. So that could be the ebook, the webinar, the blog post. Macro is everything. Macro is your whole resource center. How easy is it for people to navigate? How easy is it for people to discover the right content? How tailored are the different sections within that resource center? And how easy is it for your audience to discover those sections? Um, for most marketers, they don't have the ability to um, really optimize that experience, but it's essential for you to be able to actually meet your goals. So optimizing that micro and macro experience really gives you more bang for your buck because a lot of us are really using content for demand generation, really using content to generate leads, which means we're actually putting dollars behind it. And if we're spending these dollars to bring people back to our maybe premium content like eBooks and white papers, and we're bringing them back to a crappy experience that's not going to convert very well, that's like flushing money down the toilet. And, and that's really, I think, a big thing to consider is how much waste happens there when you could really be making a few small adjustments that optimize that experience and, and also test and see what works. So how do you get more bang for your buck? Okay, so let's start with the micro experience. So I just wanted to show some really practical examples of what we do. Um, and there's, there's a lot of really great examples there. So take these to heart in terms of you know, how you can think of starting to optimize your own experience. Uh, I want to show you specifically an ebook that we, um, that we actually put out, I want to say about six months ago. I'd have to double check on the actual date there. Now, this ebook you can see was created primarily for the purpose of lead generation. And not just volume, right? We were really, really focused on we want specific people that care about these specific things. The ebook is called Data Driven Content Marketing. So, you can tell right away it's a riveting subject, right? It's not exactly a beach read, so it's not necessarily going to have mass appeal. Um, but it is going to appeal to the type of people that we want to talk to because we know that those are the type of people that really make a good fit with Uberflip. So when I look at this experience, a couple things to keep in mind. Number one, it's responsive. And I, I almost hate talking about the fact that you need a responsive experience or a mobile friendly experience because it's like, oh my God, we all know that. Um, but here's the reality. The reality is the vast majority of B2B websites, of B2B blogs, of B2B resource centers, wherever you're housing your content, and trust me, I look at a ton of these. All of our customers have these. The vast majority are not responsive, which means you're sacrificing leads, you're sacrificing conversion, you're sacrificing subscribers, and ultimately you're sacrificing revenue. Um, you, know, you want to make sure that you have a compelling message to get people to convert. And you'll notice that most people will actually do a landing page in order to gate an ebook. Um, we actually use call to actions uh, overlays, so little pop ups to gate our ebooks, which is something that we can do through Uberflip. Now, either way, you can, you can optimize the experience, whether you're doing a landing page, whether you're doing an overlay like this. For us, we found this converts better um, because you can kind of see the content back there. It's a, little bit of a, it's a little bit of a teaser, right? So you fill out that form and you're in right away. There's less steps to get to that content. And the other thing you want to keep in mind is that you have to give people mechanisms to engage. Again, this is basic stuff, guys. But if you don't have share buttons there that are clear and easy, no one's going to share your stuff. Um, really, really basic stuff, but again, as marketers, we don't always have the control to be able to optimize that experience. So a well-optimized experience can really get you good results. So you can see just from the conversion rate here, huge conversion rate in terms of how people were actually filling out the form. So those are, that's actual form fills. We had 1,500 net new leads off this, and actually that pipeline number is a little bit higher now. I think it's over 500K in pipeline. So optimizing that experience made a big difference for us. And you can imagine is, let's say we cut that conversion rate um, in half or less than half. Let's say we did a 20% conversion rate, which incidentally is still high because most people are pulling in less than 10% conversion on their content and on their premium assets. That would have completely killed that pipeline number, right? So you can see the impact of a really high converting experience. Um, another example of, of this, guys, is actually one of our customers. They did something similar where they tested a landing page um, against that sort of pop-up type version of gated content, and they also saw a really good increase in conversion. Um, but regardless of how you're going to do it, the, the theme to take away here is that you need to test and optimize, and you really need to think about that experience. Now, <laughs> that's great for premium content, but then what about 
blog content? How do I think about optimizing that, which may be more top of the funnel, maybe more based around engagement? So here's an example of a blog post. Um, that we really um, we really sort of optimize, and just a couple of things to keep in mind when you're looking at optimizing the experience for more top of the funnel content. Um, now we write a lot about marketing automation at Uberflip. Uh, you'll you'll see a bunch of that type of content if you go to hub.uberflip.com. Part of the reason is because we integrate with those tools. We speak the same language. <laughs> content fuels marketing automation, so um, we find that those are the types of sort of audience that we have: content marketers, demand generation, marketing technologists digital marketers, that kind of stuff. So when we look at this, just kind of taking a quick look, you can see it's super shareable, lots of really great um, sort of share icons there that are visible, easy to use. The visual, we've got a great image there. It's scannable, and what I mean by that is that um, the content is well structured. The format of it is well structured. There's subheads as you scroll down the page. The paragraphs aren't too long, so it's easy for the eye to go down and scan it. Stuff like that is really important to pay attention to because if the text on your page is hard to read, people aren't going to read it, <laughs> right? Um, you know, there's recommended content for people to consume additional content, and you'll notice that this call to action here is highly, highly tailored for a specific segment of our audience. And that's because this individual piece of content lives in a very tailored section of our resource center. So you know what? It's in a section called Everything Marketo. So I'm going to make sure that that call to action is also very, very targeted. And we all know as marketers, the more targeted your CTA, the better it's going to convert for you. So those are the high points that you want to keep in mind in terms of optimizing your content. The other thing to think about when you're optimizing sort of those individual pieces of content is what form should that content take? So Lena, I grabbed this from your, uh, your resource center, and I love this, because content shouldn't necessarily just be sort of the standard format that we think about. We think about blog posts, we think about eBooks, but the reality is the more somebody can interact with you, the better of a relationship they can get, the more connectivity they can get. So you, know, you have to consider the whole experience of how they're consuming content. For whatever it is that you're trying to accomplish, for whatever your goals are, does it make sense for this to be more interactive experience? And that's something that people don't really think about at all. Thank you so much for sharing this one. I loved that. I thought when I saw that in the slides you sent over. <laughs> yeah, no, I and I think I think you guys do a really great job of that, and that's something we want to start to do more of down the road. Is more of that interactive content. Um, but I mean, I think I think you would also agree that you know you have to take the right thing for the right situation and the right goal. So in some cases it might be the perfect thing, in other cases something else might work. So <laughs> it's a little bit um, you know it's a little bit of a part art, part science kind of thing. I think. Exactly. Yeah, you don't want to just put the blanket content out there. You want to make sure it's the right content for the right person at the right time. That kind of cliche. Yeah, you you got it. Um, so let's touch on the macro experience, and then, and then we'll actually um, circle back and start to take some questions. So we talked about sort of how to optimize the micro experience, so the one-off pieces of content. Um, but what's the macro experience? So for most of us in B2B marketing, it's something like a resource center, right? Which <coughs> might include um, your blog articles, it might include eBooks and white papers and webinars. Um, and, and like, what do you think of when I say resource center? Most people just think of this ongoing page of, of content. Most of the time, the user experience on most resource centers isn't very good. Um, most of the time, it hasn't been refreshed. And what we think of when we hear resource center, <laughs> unfortunately, is that it's a place the content goes to die. Now, that <laughs> might seem very, very um, dark, but think about it. On most resource centers, you will publish your white paper that you just released and you created a big splash about and you're super proud of it. You've invested a ton of time and effort. You publish it and then slowly but surely it starts to go to the bottom of your resource center and slowly but surely it gets buried, never to be seen again, never to be surfaced again, never to be discovered again because it's not organized in a way that people can find it. <laughs> it's not organized in a way where it's actually tailored to a specific segment of your audience. It's just kind of sitting there in the background. So, how do we start to think about optimizing that experience? Well, you have to think about really structuring your, the macro experience, that, that whole content experience, and thinking about it holistically. And really thinking about, okay, how do I structure my resource center? How do I pull out the specific topics and 
um, sort of segments of my audience that I want to be talking to, and how do I structure them in a way where the content that's relevant to them is most discoverable? And in order to do that, you really, really, really need to know your audience. So for us, um, as I mentioned before, you know, one of the ways we actually segment our content is um, through various marketing automation tools because those audience segments are ones that really engage a lot with us. So this is that market stream that I showed you before. But this is not the individual piece of content. This is the whole section in our, in our resource center. And you can see that you know, we will, it's well organized. These menu items at the top um, and these tailored streams of content are done by our marketing team. We don't need a developer for that. It's a very tailored experience. It's optimized for our goals. It's got a relevant content mix, right? So not only is the call to action um, targeted, but the content there is all content that is tailored towards that segment of our audience. And again, we ask the idea, is your content resonating? Is your content experience resonating? Not just that one-off piece of content, but the recommended content, the next piece they're going to go to, the email campaign that you're going to run, the lead nurture that you're, that you're executing on. So all of that stuff is stuff that you need to take into account because resonating with your customer and building a connection isn't just about one piece of content. It's about that ongoing dialogue between you and your, um, your audience, your customer, the individual. So a couple of, couple of don'ts <laughs> for a resource center. Uh, and again, there's, there's tools you can use for this, but sometimes you, know, you, ha you have a developer that you need to work with, and sometimes there's low-hanging fruit that you can start to um, change around, whether, whether you're using you know, a standard CMS, whether you're engaging with a developer or an agency, or whether you're using a tool to power your resource center. Um, so a couple things to remember. So number one, don't organize your content by content type. And here's what I mean by that. I'll come back to this page in a second, but here's what I mean by that. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Um, basically, people are often organizing their content under categories of the, the format of content that it is. So here are all my white papers. Here are all my webinars. Here are all my case studies. Here are all my data sheets. Never have I gone to somebody's resource center and said, oh my god, I really want to read a white paper. I don't care what it's about. I don't care about the topic. I just really, really want to read a white paper. Nobody says that, right? What people want is they want to really engage about certain topics. They want to solve their problems. And they really want to find content that's tailored and resonating with their needs. So how do you start to do this? Well, here's a couple of really good examples. So Lena, I love how you guys are doing this. So you actually organize your content both by topics. You've got demand gen here. You've got content marketing here. Um, so oftentimes the demand gen person and the content marketing person are two different people. They're not necessarily going to want the same, same um, content. But you also have it by format. So people can actually search whatever they want. The danger becomes is you're only doing it by format. So I love the way you guys have structured it. Browse by type, browse by format. The other example that I really love is Avanti. Um, and they actually segmented it by, uh, essentially by buyer persona. So they cater to a software company, uh, financial services I believe, but they cater to a few different departments in the organization. So they deal sometimes with payroll, sometimes with HR, sometimes with finance, sometimes with IT. Obviously, the HR person is going to want very different content than the IT person. So they've structured their content accordingly, which is way better than just looping in all white papers, all webinars, all ebooks, all case studies, all together in one. So that's the kind of stuff that I think um, we need to start to think about as we, um, as we think about those resource centers. And, and I mean, the last example, I think I showed you this already, we do it based on audience segments. So for us, we talk, like I said, we talk a lot about marketing automation. So that's one example of how we do it. Now, a couple of other things to remember with your resource center. You know, don't organize by content type, so we pretty much covered that. Try not to make it static. So your content needs to be discoverable. You need to be able to surface things um, as people want to consume it. And that's where reorganizing sort of the different sections of your resource center makes sense. Um, and that should be something that you should be doing fairly regularly. It should be an iterative process. It's never just a, okay, we've overhauled our, our resource center design and it's good for another few years because I promise you it won't be. Um, and then the other thing to keep in mind, don't let your call to action get scale. Um, try and make sure you're changing those up as your goals evolve and change. It's really easy to throw a button up on your blog or to throw a call to action up on your, on your resource center and just kind of leave it and forget about it. Um, and, and then it ends up kind of getting stale over time and not necessarily performing as well. So that's something you want to keep in mind starting to 
really check out um, different ways of doing that. So I think that kind of drives home the point of it's not just resonance, it's also about that overall experience. I uh, really want to get into questions because we've only got about 10 minutes or so here. So Lena, if you're ready to go, let's jump into some of these questions. Ready to go. Awesome. Um, so here's an interesting one from Donna. Uh, any thoughts on how to identify executive level needs? This is a tough one because it's hard to get the execs on the phone and filling out surveys. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Um, what I've had good luck with is going a little bit through an intermediary. So at SnapApp, our senior executives have the um, the privilege of having many relationships with other senior executives. So I've gone through them for an intro to sort of higher level people who might not respond to a cold call from me. So that could be one one way to do it. Um, I would mm -hmm. also I would also look at um, you know don't shy away from putting yourself out there in the real world. So if you are going to some of these industry events or even just like cocktail hour type things, go introduce yourself. You know, you a lot of people get caught up in the like, oh, they're a senior executive, they don't want to spend time with me. Um, just sort of erase that from your brain if you can, and try to meet these people in person and build those relationships. Um, that's kind of what I would recommend. Um, Hannah, have you? Mm -hmm. Do you have any experience doing that? Yeah, I mean, I, it's. I think it depends. So <laughs> one of the things that I think you want to think about as well is, um, and as, as I guess not great as this may sound, is have somebody of equal or higher um, status, I guess, I'm not sure title maybe is the right way to do it, um, reach out. So, I mean, we find this at Uberflip is, you know, if one of my BDRs on the sales team is trying to connect with like a VP marketing somewhere, um, they often have a hard time doing it. But if I email them as the VP marketing of Uberflip, then it's like, oh, it's like a VP to VP conversation. So it's a little bit superficial, but <laughs> that would be something to, to try and um, try and start to do is like, you know, don't reach out yourself, but have somebody that's a little bit more senior reach out so they feel as though they're being connected with, with somebody that's, um, that's more senior. The other thing that works really well for, for some of the companies that I've talked to is using something like um, like an advocate hub. So I know we use Intuitive, um, and <laughs> surprisingly, um, you can you can get engagement sometimes from these higher level executives and something like that. So that can be something you can play around with as well. For sure, cool. I would say so, even though they yeah. might seem intimidating, they're still people. Totally, totally, totally. Um, so next question, Rebecca wants to know what methods for surveys have you tried um, and have been effective for information gathering on customers? Uh, do you send them out by email? Is there any other way that you guys do it at SNAP? Um, yeah, we've done email surveys. We also have a good track record with in-event surveys, so bringing SNAP apps to, uh, to the booth with us on an iPad and then doing surveys that way. Um, I've also seen people have good luck with sending them out over social media. Um, you can do that type of call to action or even throwing a little bit of paid media behind it. The take a survey, share your opinion, kind of call to action on a paid ad can be really compelling to get people to click through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I really like that. Um, so one of the things that, uh, one of the things I guess that um, we do that seems to actually work really well is uh, really around um, using like an in-app tool. So if we want customers to fill out the survey um, or people that are actually using the Uberflip application, we use this tool called Intercom. So that will just pop up in-app and you can set the parameters for that around. Uh, so we want people that are using this feature to fill out this survey. So you can get really targeted. So that's, that's another thing to try out depending on sort of your product and your business model. Obviously that only works if you're a tech product. Um, and if you're not, that might not be <laughs> definitely, definitely think about it. Um, so one more from Rebecca, and then we're going to move on to Jesse's question. Uh, Rebecca wants to know, as a marketer, what's a good way to approach a customer to interview them um, to help with content? What would the ask B. <coughs> so actually, before I kick this over to you, Lena, um, Rebecca, check out our podcast, uberflip.com slash podcast. 
Um, I actually talked about this very thing with Anam Hussain, who is a growth marketer at HubSpot, and she's got a great list of what they call audience survey questions, where they really talk to their audience in order to determine what the right type of content is in order to um, in order to actually reach out to them. And the questions they ask are actually pretty broad, so it's it's really more around of you know what do they consume over the course of the day? How do they spend, you know, how do they spend their work day? How is it structured? Like very, very broad stuff. But definitely check out that episode of, um, of the podcast because I think that that will really help. Um, Lena, any thoughts on that yourself? Let's see. I've had pretty good luck with flattery. So <laughs> I reach out to customers um, and I say, oh my God, Dana, the, our whole team is going crazy over this piece of content you guys created. I would absolutely love the opportunity to learn how you made it, what, you know, what worked for you doing it. And that typically gets a pretty good response. Marketers like to kind of show, show off the great stuff that they've been working on. Um, and I've also had a good experience with, um, so you've got the flattery angle. And then mm -hmm. there's the, I like <laughs> right. Um, and then there's the, um, I think you actually have a really valuable opinion to add on this angle, um, which is a type of flattery, I guess. You could think of it that way. Um, but it's, it's presenting it in the lens of, hey, I'm working on this proje project. I would love your feedback because I think you actually have, you know, something really compelling to add. Um, that can be a really, it's a lot of different sort of entrees into the same conversation. So it, you can frame it in terms of, I want to talk about this project that you worked on, or I want, you know, your feedback on a project I'm working on. Um, and you can use those as um, entry points to a general conversation about who they are and what they're struggling with and kind of those audience interview type questions. Yeah, I think I think those are all really good, um, <laughs> really good tactics. Sorry, guys, really good tactics to use. Um, I like I like the flattery one because I know I get a lot of the emails, and I'm like, yeah, they like our content, um, and it totally works, even though I know exactly what, <laughs> what you're doing. Um, <laughs> wants to know uh, how do you take into account diversity in your audience? I mean, from our perspective, Jesse, it's really all about audience segmentation and getting the right content to the right people. Um, if you if you have a database that's big enough to, to segment your audience, if, if you don't and you're early stage, then you should be pretty focused anyway. Um, I don't know, Lena, do you have anything to add to that? The only thing I would add is, you know, one of the benefits of interactive content is you can offer people uh, sort of a personality quiz or what we call an assessment that will give users one of several outcomes that you've identified, and they'll answer a certain set of questions, and then they'll get their unique result. And on that result page, you can give them contextual follow-up content or suggestions for things that they should do next. So that's a, a way to kind of create one piece of content that's tailored to a certain segment, but then within that piece of content, you can actually tailor it further based on the questions and answers that you've gone through. Cool. Um, so Donna, Donna has more has a comment than anything, and I'll, I'll actually share this link that she shared just so everybody can see it. Um, she's basically saying she's surprised that the longer the post, the more shareable, um, which is, is a little bit counterintuitive, but it's it's true from the data that I've seen. So I think the longer posts do tend to often add a lot of value, a lot of time, and 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 effort was put into creating them. So because of that, they tend to be more shareable to, to others. The other thing to take into account is that people share stuff that they don't read. So if it's something that they think is going to make them look smart, and often that's like the big, long, in-depth articles, then they're going to share that anyway. So I think it's probably a little bit of both there. Um, Very true. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so Andre wants to know, when you think of starting a blog, how can you optimize the experience? Um, and he's asking with family and friends. So uh, <laughs> um, I'm not sure what the family and friends part means other than maybe just having them check out the experience and kind of do a little user testing for you, which is definitely a great idea. Um, but I think you need to start with something. Um, and start with something that, uh, that seems to be hitting the right marks um, with your 
target audience, and, and in that case, you want to put it in front of them, and then just test from there. So optimize and test, optimize and test. Um, there's a lot of really great resources on how to do that online, so we can definitely include those in the in the resources. Um, Lena, do you have anything to add on that one? Um, I would add, I guess, that if you're starting a new blog, make sure you're starting it from with a motivation to serve your audience. So if you know who your audience is and you know the questions that they're asking and the things that they care about, focus your blog's editorial calendar on solving those problems and answering those questions. It can be super straightforward, and that's how you're going to start attracting people in as a new audience. Yeah, totally. And how you optimize is also going to depend on like, hey, what are your goals, right? So you're going to do that differently depending on what your overall goals are. Um, so we're, we're pretty much done on time, guys, so I'm going to try and zip through the rest of these questions. Um, John has a comment around if your content is getting buried, um, then it's not very well SEO optimized. So just to clarify on that, John, um, I wasn't talking about the searchability of your content. I was talking about the discoverability of it once they're actually on your um, resource center. So a little bit of a distinction there. I um, agree with you about SEO. So, so I want to make sure that um, the searchability is there when people are looking for it. But when they land on your blog or your website or your resource center, um, that's more about discoverability. So are they able to easily discover the things that they need in order to solve their problems? Um, and Maria would like to know, in our experience, how effective is SEO optimization by itself in attracting qualified traffic to a site versus other mediums such as social media? Um, and Lena, I don't know if you have any input here, but SEO is still really important, guys. <laughs> That's pretty much all I've got to say. <laughs> yeah, I would echo that. I mean, a huge chunk of our inbound traffic is, or our website traffic is inbound from search, so definitely still super critical. Yeah, and and again, like it. SEO and content really go hand in hand, right? So like you need to be really targeted with your content strategy and make sure that you're focused on specific topics and that's going to help with your SEO strategy provided that everything is structured properly. Um, so do you know any survey template resources that you could share with us? Uh, and that's from Bahia. Sorry, Bahia, if I'm totally butchering your, your name. Um, Lena, do you have anything that you guys use in-house? Yeah, so we have a couple of um, sort of templates and worksheets and things like that for designing surveys and interactive content all in our Uberflip hub on our website. It's just content.snapapp.com. So I'd take a look over there. Um, and then I loved, you know, your, you recommended going to look at Anum's um, podcast that you guys mm -hmm. did together. So it sounds like she had some really good suggestions as well. Yeah, no, she definitely does. In terms of the actual um, templates, uh, and, and tools you can use. There's so many tools out there that sometimes will also provide templates. So type, type pad or type form, I believe, is a good one. Get feedback yeah, is a great type one. Form. Um, yeah, yeah, I really like Typeform. It's a nice, clean look. And a lot of those survey tools actually have great content around what kind of questions you can ask. So definitely check those out. And last but not least, and this is from Rachel, what are your thoughts on landing pages for each piece of content? What type of information should be featured on those landing pages instead of giving too much away and not capturing the content information through a form? So again, I'm going to go back to what are your goals, <laughs> excuse me, what are your goals? If your goal is lead generation, then maybe you do need to gate content. Now whether that's a landing page or an overlay CTA like what we do, um, I, I'm not going to sort of nitpick there. But if you are going to get that piece of content, number one, you've got to make sure that it's really valuable and that it's worth people paying an email address for with it. Right? So if I'm going to give my email address, I want to get something really good in return. And if I don't, uh, I'm going to get kind of pissed off. right? And then you just basically lost me. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. So I would really only gate the stuff for that really um, you think is going to provide a lot of value for people. Um, and only if your goal is around lead generation, right? If your goal is around engagement, um, even the really valuable pieces of content might be worth keeping open because um, if you want engagement and like thought leadership and awareness and exposure, then you can really get a lot of good um, exposure through a really in-depth piece of content. Like we said before, the longer your content, the more shareable it is. So again, it depends on your goal. Um, in terms of what to put on the landing page, you really want to just put the highlights. 
Um, so what are the key values that people are going to take, be able to take away after consuming this piece of content? So generally for us, if, if we do a landing page for a webinar, it's a paragraph, a short paragraph with three points around what they're going to pull out. And that's pretty much it. And then we'll usually add the speakers as well, just to add that level of credibility so people know that whoever's talking on that webinar um, actually kind of knows their stuff, right? Um, I, Lena, do you have anything to add on that one? Um, I would add what I like to see when I go to landing pages to download content is a little bit of almost like purchase protection. So some assurance before I fill in the form that what I'm getting is going to be what I think I'm getting. So screenshots, um, thumbnails, some sort of preview of the content that's to come can be really an easy way to make people happier to say yes. Hello? Hannah, did we lose you? Oh, you know what? I was on mute because I had a bit of a uh -huh. talking fit. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> um, <coughs> excuse me, guys. Uh, so I was just saying thanks for everybody for the great questions. We're going to wrap it up because we're already over time. You know, that was awesome. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. It was a pleasure. Great. So for those of you that are sticking around and are interested, I am going to zip into Uberflip and show you guys a quick demo uh, of what we can actually do for your content. So bear with me here for a moment while I share my screen with you. Cool. So um, before I show you sort of <laughs> what Uberflip does, and what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to show you how Uberflip uses Uberflip. So we're going to get a little bit meta here. Um, but to kind of give you that high level, what we essentially do is we'll actually help you aggregate your content whether that's blog content, social media content, ebooks, white papers, videos, any kind of content, into what's essentially a hub. So once you've got it all into the Uberflip platform, you can create really tailored experiences. And those tailored experiences can be really targeted towards certain buyer personas. You can use it to power the resource center on your website, and then within your resource center, split it off to different um, sections and tailored experiences. And then we let you optimize that for lead generation through nested forms and those overlays that I showed you earlier, and then of course measuring the performance. So really it's kind of a cross between kind of that content management platform and really that content marketing platform. And what we really like to say is, you know, a lot of us are doing our resource center through something like a CMS like WordPress or Drupal. The reality is those weren't designed for content marketing. Um, and content marketers often need a different tool set in order to be able to execute without having to over rely on IT. So I'm going to show you guys our content hub. Now this is um, basically our version of our resource center. And as you scroll down, you're going to see we've aggregated all of that content. We've got it all here in the latest feed of our content. And <laughs> the reality is we've got all sorts of different types of content. So it's a very rich experience. I've got articles. I've got eBooks. I've got video content, social media content, and sprinkled throughout, I've also got these calls to action. Now, normally it takes us you know, weeks for a developer to get this custom uh, form in here in this nested form because of all the processes we have to kind of go through. Um, but with Uberflip, you can really do these in a matter of minutes. And the beauty is you can take all of this content. This is kind of the latest feed, but you can start to segment it into these different custom streams. So as I mentioned before, we'll split content up by topic. So you know, what topic are you most interested in? We'll split it up by um, audience segment. So our HubSpot users, our Marketo users, our Eloqua users. Um, you know, we'll split content up by stream. So we've got a special stream for our podcast that just launched. So really looking at how we can make content more tailored to different parts of the audience and how they can best engage with it. Um, so this is an example of a very tailored stream of content to Marketo users. You'll see the content here is much more relevant for them, and you'll see the call to action is much more relevant. Now these calls to action are not just sort of sprinkled throughout the content here. You can also see them at the individual item level, so the individual piece of content. We can place a CTA right beside it. And we can also take those calls to action and use them to gate content. So you know, we 
I think showed this uh, to you before in getting an ebook, but this is a way that we get actually one of our webinar recordings, same kind of way. And you can see the content is right back here, and I fill out the form and I'm in right away. So it tends to convert really well as opposed to a big landing page, you fill it out, you go to another page, it says thank you for filling out the landing page, and you click on another button, and then finally you get to your ebook. It's a bit of a process sometimes. Now, with Uberflip, we're really not just concerned about the front end experience that we're showing to our customer. And incidentally, I mean, I'm showing you Uberflip's version of Uberflip, but this is all brandable towards your own brand, all customizable. You can even use some custom CSS to make the tiles look a little bit different. There's tons you can do in order to make sure the look and feel is in line with what you want. Um, but on the back end, as a marketer, Here's what you're actually going to use in order to manage all of that content, add those calls to action, and really measure performance. So we're just as concerned with your experience as a marketer as we are with the experience of your audience that's actually consuming your content. And you can see here, it's very clean, very simple, very easy to use. You can manage your content. You can create those calls to action. You can manage the appearance of your hub. <laughs> You've got a lot of automated tools to make your life easier. Um, you know, for example, creating a call to action is as simple as really clicking a button, you know, waiting for that CTA to come up, picking whether or not you want it to link out or whether you want to create a form, and then customizing the color and the um, message, and you're done in a matter of minutes. Again, normally this takes a developer a lot of time and effort to go back and forth with um, in terms of the marketing person and the developer working together. So that was a quick look at what Uberflip can do with your content. Again, it's really all about managing that content experience. Um, if you are using interactive content with some of the stuff that Snap App does, you can totally embed that into an Uberflip hub. So if you're interested in learning more, be sure to head over to uberflip.com. Um, and as I mentioned before, we recently launched our podcast. Um, so some great content in there uh, about content. <laughs> um, so really relevant to you guys. You can head over to uberflip.com slash podcast for the details there. Once again, guys, thanks for joining us. Uh, keep an eye on your inbox. We'll have the recording and the slides to you in the next couple of days. Mm -hmm.